From my earliest memory, my sister and I went to church with my mother and father. I especially remember during World War II when Dad sold the car we had because of fuel and rubber was needed for the war effort. And I remember that we walked down Wildwood to a field. Now, when you're six, seven, and eight years old, everything looks bigger than you are. And it looks that way because it is that way. And I remember walking through this field with big, tall grass in it. And there was a path through it. And it came out on Hillsborough Road. We'd then make a right turn and walk up to the Hillsborough Church Building and go to worship on Sunday. I remember sermons that Brother Goodpasture would preach. I didn't understand most of them as a little boy. I thought he used big words. And I later learned to love him deeply, and he baptized me. He also started my library, and I'm in great debt to him. I remember singing the hymns. I remember two-week vacation Bible school. And I remember that in almost every Bible class, we had memory work. We had to memorize passages, and the next Sunday, we'd have to say them. And if you forgot to do your memory work, then you always would be okay because you could quote one verse in the Gospel of John. Jesus wept. And the teacher would frown at you knowing you forgot your memory work. I remember at Christmas time going with Dad to deliver groceries to those who didn't have any groceries in certain parts of Nashville. And I learned to love the church. But I want to be honest with you this morning. The church of my childhood is history. The church of today is not the church of the 1940s during World War II. And most of us know that already. Most of us recognize that our times have changed And while we may not understand it fully, that that there's some huge cultural shift that has taken place, almost like the changing of the plates in the earth as the earth shifts. That this cultural change has created a world that would shock our grandparents. I think it would shock my parents. They never knew of iPhones or Internet. They never used words like global or interactive. They never knew of a church that would be experiential. They didn't dream of opportunities that you and I can dream of today. They didn't realize that on a given Sunday you could have 120 people in Guatemala and Honduras. Add to that Ukraine. Add to that quick travel to almost any place in the world. So today I want to ask some fresh questions. And I don't want us to be afraid of the answers because there's no reason to be afraid. I deeply love this church. And for 19 years, Barbara and I have tried to serve it. There have been times when we have thought it was pretty rough. I felt that way when I first came. I wondered if I'd made a mistake by leaving Missouri. There have been times in which we've had great, great joy special moments of worship, watching you sacrifice your money, going to mission fields to represent you, especially in places like Russia for 12 different years. We love Preston Crest Church of Christ. And it will always hold that special preeminent place in our hearts. In these final few Sundays with you, as I said last week, I've wanted to preach on some 
great themes. Last week was on obedience. And today I want to speak on the nature of the church. And I've entitled it, Tomorrow's Church. That title comes because I want to think about the church of the future. I don't want to talk to you about yesteryear. I want to talk to you about what I see in the future, and especially for this congregation. I want you to take really careful notes this morning, so if you'll reach for your bulletin and maybe a pen, you can look at the Scriptures and look at the notes and fill in the blanks, if you will. But the main thing I'm after and hoping for are open hearts. Elders, open your hearts. Deacons, small group leaders, Bible school teachers, mom and dads, singles, those of you who are older, open your hearts to the teaching of the Word of God this morning. Let's not waste our time. Let's use our time and really do some serious, honest thinking about tomorrow's church. Now, the first thing I want to say to you has to do with the Bible. When I think of this church, and I think of the future of this church, one of the first things I want to say to you is, I want you to be more biblical. I want you to be more biblical. And to do that, I think some key shifts must take place if you are to be more biblical. Jesus said in Matthew 9, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Let's pour some new wine into some new wine skins for just a moment. And let's realize that when we do, it means they are both going to be preserved, to use the words of Jesus. What key shifts need to take place? Well, we need to move from church to Christ. We need to move from church to Christ. Now, I love the church. I love the church I was reared in. I love the church of the 40s. It was fun being a little boy, going to church. I love this church. But folks, this is not about us. It's not about us getting the credit. How many times on the mission field have we failed to cooperate with anybody else that was there because we wanted to be sure that the church of Christ got the credit? How many opportunities could we have had in Dallas because we wanted to be dead certain that we got the glory? We didn't say it that way, but we did say we want to be sure we get the credit. Now, folks, the church of tomorrow is about Jesus. It isn't about us. It isn't about us getting the credit. It isn't about us getting the glory. We are powerless, the Bible says. We stand before a powerful God. The power is in Jesus. Don't talk to your neighbors about the church of Christ. Talk to them about Jesus. 
Now, somebody says you're putting down the church. I'm not putting down the church. I love the church. You'll have time to talk about the church later. But you cannot draw people to a church. You draw people to the Son of God. This is why Paul frequently will say, I preached only to you, Jesus. I only preach Jesus. Talk to people about Jesus. Let Jesus be the topic of your conversation. Let them know that you go to a church that believes in Jesus. Jesus will be the dividing point between those that follow Him and those that follow the Muslim faith. Mark my words. Jesus is the dividing point. Not God. But Jesus and the people that are going to come to Dallas in the next 25 years and make this their home, many of them will be Muslims. You need to be talking about Jesus. You need to be saying Jesus. You need to be drawing people to Jesus. You need to teach your teenagers Jesus. Jesus is where the power is. It's not about us. It's about Jesus if you're biblical. Next, we need to move from club to community. We have our rights and our symbols, but we have developed over the years our own language, our own vocabulary. I can talk to you in ten minutes and find out if you're a member of the church of Christ or not. You know how I know that? The words you use. I know the words. I know the vocabulary. I know how to talk. I know the inside. I know the rites and the rituals. And we need to move to community. Guys, we are far too white. I watched one of our TV shows come on this morning. Sponsored by Churches of Christ. When they showed the singing, everybody in it looked like they were over 50 and everybody was white. The world of the future is not white. And if you look white, and if everybody's white, and if the only people in our church are white, and if the only people that are ever elders are white, and deacons are white, and preachers are white, what does that say to a world that is no longer predominantly white? We've got to move from club to community because it's biblical. It's biblical. We need relationships and connections. And you may even find yourself thinking about multi-sites. What if you had one congregation here and one in Frisco? What if you had one congregation in Frisco, one here, and one in downtown Dallas? When have you been to downtown Dallas recently? When have you looked at what's going in down there? Who's going to minister to all these people that are going to live in these huge apartment houses, condominiums? There is not a church of Christ down there. And when I drove around the other night down there, I was just immediately captured by the idea. Who's going to minister to these people? Who's going to take Jesus to these you're going to have to think way outside the box here to begin to think about how do you make community as the New Testament church really did. We're going to have to move from rules to relationships. Churches in the future that have small groups like this one, Bob Chisholm is an expert in small groups. He won't tell you that, I'll tell you that. Bob Chisholm led in small group ministry back in the 80s when very few congregations did it. Why do you have small groups? Because it is all over the New Testament. They didn't have church buildings. 
They had congregations meeting in cities and made up in house churches. We've got to move from sectarian rules to relationships because it's biblical and right. The church of tomorrow has got to move from words to images. When Gutenberg invented the press, we became a word culture. I grew up in a word culture. Today's children are growing up in an image culture. They're growing up on the Internet. They're growing up on television. I mean, when you drive down the tollway today, you're likely to come up behind an SUV, and guess what it's got in it? Two TVs going for the children. We live in an image world filled with motion, filled with stories. The parables of Jesus are all stories. They're about images. The Word of God is a story. When I thought of a title for my little book on Genesis, I entitled it The Great Story because it's the story of God. The story. Tell the story of God and of Jesus to your children and to your neighbors. We live in a world that is moving to images. And we are moving from consumerism to involvement. The church of the future will have participation in it. It will have equipping body life in it. It will have balance in it. One of the wonderful things happening in this church is friends speak. The only problem with friends speak is it's too small. It's just too small. Now, it's big by most standards because they can hardly get everybody in a room. In fact, I'm not sure they can get everybody in a room. They can't get them all in one room. Can't get them all in the searcher's class over there. But why don't you have friends speak in here? Why don't you fill this place up with Hispanics, Nigerians, Ethiopians, Ghanaians? Who's coming to study medicine in Dallas? Who's coming to get PhDs in Dallas? Who's coming to be future leaders of their nations in Dallas? Find those people. Teach them Jesus. Release the women of this church. Let them tell the story of Jesus to Ethiopians and Nigerians through friends speak. And instead of it running once or twice a week, run it seven days a week. Use this building. Use the one you're about to pay off. Fill that building with people from other nations and teach them Jesus. And let them know in this church that every woman, every man, and every young person find their gift and participate. The churches that are catering to their members to make them happy will not be here in the future. Consumerism is not the way you run a church. It may be the way you run a business. But it is not the way you become a biblical congregation. Now, how are we going to get there? I want to lay down five principles that I see in the Word. How are we going to get to tomorrow? How are we going to think outside the box? How are we going to release women? How are we going to use our young people? How are we going to use people that are African-American and Hispanic to find their place in the Lord's church? How do we get there? These are principles. First, we have got to view worship differently. We've got to see worship as whole life, not as a Sunday event. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. 
Paul is not talking about what we're doing right now on Sunday. He is talking about seeing worship as your whole life, presenting your body to God every day, Tuesday night, Thursday morning, when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're studying, when you're playing, when you're on vacation, when you're driving your car. Worship in the Bible is not a Sunday event only. It is mainly an entire life where you do not conform to this world, as he says in the next verse, but you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will please God. The church of the future has got to see worship differently. It cannot put all of its eggs in the Sunday basket. It's got to see that marriage is worship. It's got to see that singleness is worship. It's got to see that raising kids is worship. It's got to see that dealing with people that are different from you is worship. Every attitude of your heart, mind is worship. It is not simply a Sunday event that takes place once a week. And that kind of compartmentalization has cost us dearly in the last 20 or 30 years. Because we've talked about worship as being a Sunday event, then we built a church building for that event, then we had debates on what you can do in the building. And the whole thing was false. Because it's not an event. It's your whole life, Preston Crest. Men, it's the way you deal with women. Women, it's the way you deal with children. It's the way you deal with your elders. It's the way you deal with your preachers. It's the way you deal with people. Worship never was conceived biblically as a single event on a Sunday. And then when we built a church, and then we started debating on what you can do in it and can't do in it, Satan had us right where he wanted us. And we wasted all those years. It is whole life if it's biblical. Now, if it isn't that, you tell me why it isn't that. You give me the Bible on where it is. Romans 12 teaches as one of the verses that your worship is your entire life. You're worshiping when you're driving that car. You're worshiping when you're using your language. You're worshiping when you're having sex with your husband or your wife. You're worshiping when you're rearing those kids. Let's be honest at least and admit that this is going to be our rule book. And if the Bible is going to be your rule book, worship has got to be viewed differently. Second principle. The church lives out the gospel. It is not isolated from people. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. From the very beginning, God's vision of the church was the church lives its life out in the world where people can see and hear it. We're not isolated. We don't just come in a building and isolate ourselves, develop our own vocabulary, our own symbols, our own rituals, our own rites. The gospel is to be lived in the world. Let your light so shine before men. And the gospel is to be lived out, not hunkered down where we're all fearful and scared. We need to be in country clubs. We need to be on golf courses. We need to be on the streets. We need to be talking to that guy up at Beltline that's in a wheelchair. We need to be talking about young men. We need to be talking about people in the service. 
We need to be talking to Dallas Cowboys. There is no reason for the Lord's church to be in fear unless it is totally isolated from people and becomes sectarian. And if that happens, sell the building, take the money and run. Because you're no longer God's people. You just became a business. My challenge to you for tomorrow is that you live out the gospel. That you relate to everybody in this town at every level. Do you know the new mayor? You know anything about his faith? Sheriff was here the other day. She's on the trip to Guatemala right now. You know any lesbians, gays, alcoholics, people addicted, college students? When's the last time you were on the campus at SMU? The challenge of being the people of God is to be in the world. Not of the world, that was point number one, but in the world. Out there living it out every day in front of people. Thirdly, it's about globalization to God. It's not about our issues. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I'll be with you always. God's plan for His people has always been globalization. It has never been about our issues. Can we use instruments in a wedding? Can we use instruments in a funeral? What can we do in this auditorium? Is it right to call this an auditorium? They call high school buildings like this auditoriums. We sit around and talk about issues that just must turn God completely off. They aren't issues with Him. Our job is to go into all the world and to preach Jesus. Amen? It didn't sit around and become a debating society. It didn't sit around and look at each other and criticize. I don't like the way she looks, and I don't like the way he talks, and I don't like the songs they sing, and I don't like this, that, and the other. You give me a church that works, and I'll tell you about a church that doesn't have time to debate. It is not about our issues. And God is never going to ask you what your position was on anything. Ever. Go read the story of the judgment. You're not going to stand before God and He's going to say, I want to know what your position was on this, that, and the other. He doesn't want to know your position. You don't have a position. Not before God. What he wants to know is, did you teach people? Did you baptize them? Did you then disciple them? Did you teach them to follow Jesus? And did you feel the assurance of the promise of Christ for the rest of your life? The leadership and the future of the church is going to be by influence. It will not be by control. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. The leadership of the New Testament church is always by influence. It is never by power. The leadership of the New Testament church was not by a board of directors. It was by a group of shepherds. Go select these men. And here are their qualifications given twice in the New Testament. Doesn't say anything at all about power, control, and management. Paranoia is not a characteristic of New Testament shepherds. They're not interested in controlling the church managing the church, what other people will think of the church. They're interested in being gentle with the church, 
guiding the church like a mother does with her baby. Like a shepherd does with its flock. The leadership of the church is like a shepherd leading his flock. Sometimes he's in front, sometimes he's behind. Most of the time he's right in the middle of the flock. I love it when our shepherds go to the hospital. I hope some of them will go see Angie today. Barbara and I have a special feeling because we've been through this twice with one of our daughters. That's when you're being a real shepherd. That's when you're praying with the hurting. When you're sharing with those that are weak. No eldership's going to heaven because they made every elders meeting. No eldership's going to heaven because of the quality of their decision making. Leadership is always by influence. Now, our guys need some help. They need some new elders. Pick some men who love people. Don't just pick CEOs. This church is running over with them. The fact that somebody can run a business does not mean they can lead the flock. Amen? That's a secret that some folks haven't figured out yet. Biblical leadership is by influence. It is not by power. And the last one is, The church of the future is a people-releasing process. It is not a top-down structure. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. It is not top-down. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. And even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. I am so thrilled at the work of Robert Stolte. Robert's involved in trying to release the people of this church. Find your gifts and talents and be involved in it. Find out what God has blessed you with and give it to the Lord and to His church. Many of you are attorneys. Some of you are CPAs. Many of you are in business. A lot of you are in real estate. There are people here that make tons of money. You make money every day because you make it for other people. Who do you think gave you these wonderful talents? It's God. Who gave you this? Use this to the glory of God, not only in your work, but in the ministry of this church. What's needed today in Ghana, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Central America, Brazil? Think long and hard about how do you release the people of this church The women, the young people, the singles, the married couples, in order to let them serve. Let's look at a few take homes. As I think about this church and leaving you and praying about you in Nashville and thinking about you and loving you, I want to say four things to you. Be a church that encounters and wrestles with the Word of God. For the rest of your life, wrestle with the text. Some of us were taught that once we got certain parts of the text down, we had it all down. No, we didn't. And no, you won't. 
And the deeper you go into the Word of God, the deeper it will become. It will fascinate you. It is so profound. It is so beyond. It is so much deeper than anything we have. This is not like physics. This isn't like chemistry. This isn't like history. It's closer to philosophy. But it's not like statistics. It's not like once you get down these formulas, you got it. You got it. How many times before an exam someone would come up and say, how, how are you going to do it? And you say, I got this. I, got, I nailed this. this. I got this down. You can't say, I've got this down about this book. You won't ever get it down. And I'm talking here mainly about attitude. Attitude. Attitude toward the text. I'm talking mainly about the attitude that says, there are these things that you do and these things that you know. And once you got that down, you got it down. So that when Bob or whoever's preaching up here encourages you to do Bible study, you don't go home and do it because you don't think you need it because you got it down. I'm challenging that attitude. Stay in the Word. Stay close to the Word. Struggle with the Word. Wrestle with it. Re-examine it. Look at it differently. And you will see that God's Word is a profoundly deep book that will build your faith. Next, be a church that speaks the language of our community. Can we talk to business people in this area? Can we talk to people of education? Can we talk to the poor? Do we know how to talk to street people? Can we talk to Hispanics? Do we know the language of our community? We've got to learn the language of our community because our community is changing. Thirdly, be a church that lets people see and experience Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. We've got the perfect name. Churches of what? We've got the perfect name to talk about Jesus. Let people see and experience Jesus in you. We have a large Jewish community here in North Dallas. I've just gotten into some of the edges of it. But I've enjoyed so much talking about Jesus to some of our Jewish friends. Barbara and I will always remember years ago when one of the surgeons here in town, Jewish, said, if we had Passover, would you all come? And I said, of course we'd come. He said, if we had Passover, would you lead it? I never will forget that. So I brushed up on the Passover and went to Passover and led it. And for the rest of the dinner, these Jewish doctors, every one of them, wanted to talk about Jesus. When we got in the car, I told Barb, I said, I am exhausted. They asked a blue million questions about why we believe in Jesus. And so rather than putting them all in a category and turning them off, why not talk to them about Jesus? You're going to have to be friends first. You have to learn to eat with people, talk with people. But you're beautiful at that. You can do this. People need to see Jesus. And it's the Jesus that you have and know. Last, be a church that releases Jesus to a waiting world. Look around at the nations where Jesus is really, really growing. Ghana is one of them. 900 congregations, guys. What does that tell you? You don't have to study logic to figure this out. 
it says, go to Ghana. And then when you find a country where everybody is whole hum about it, where you do your best to share and nobody's interested, shake the dust off your feet and find people that are interested and go to the next village. It's impossible to travel without noticing that the church has to be more connected to the real world. What I'm going to try to teach these young ministers at Lipscomb University is not to be self-absorbed. When the church becomes self-absorbed, it talks to itself. And visitors begin to pick up real quickly that we've got a vocabulary because they don't understand it. We do, but they don't. That we have symbols and rites and rituals. But there is no place in the church of Christ for the smug and the prideful. For isolated people who call themselves only ones who are Christians. We must release people, have greater vision, and learn how to listen. It's like Southwest Airlines says, except I'm going to change it a little bit. You are now free to spiritually move around the world because you're the church of Christ.